Hello, everyone. I'm Dave Tweed from Colorado State University, and welcome to Endoscopy Talks. I would like to thank you for joining us on behalf of Colorado State University's new Translational Medicine Institute. And so today, we're joined by a good friend of mine, Dr. Mike Lieb. He graduated from the University of Georgia. He completed a residency in uh, internal medicine at Colorado State University. He then served on the faculty at Virginia Tech for many years teaching internal medicine. He is now an emeritus professor. He's also a diplomat of the ACVIM. His clinical and research interests include gastroenterology and endoscopy. He's also an avid biker, hiker, and is now trekking all through the Rocky Mountains um, uh, on uh, adventures. Dr. Lieb will be presenting on gastroscopy in dogs and cats. And with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mike Lieb. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Tweed. And it is certainly a pleasure to be here. Welcome everybody to uh, Blacksburg, Virginia, where it was a magnificent fall day today. And wherever you're coming from and whenever you watch this, I. I hope in these difficult times that you do your best and stay healthy and continue to work as a veterinarian and help the animals and clients that depend on us so much. I have the pleasure of talking about really one of my favorite things, which is uh, GI endoscopy. And we're gonna focus based on uh, time restraints on endoscopy of the stomach um, and I hope as we go through this, you'll get a very good overview of what we can see and do with the endoscope and how this can really help you in your practice, help your patients and, and help your clients. So to start off some generalities, what are the real benefits of doing endoscopy in patients with GI disease? Uh, first of all, it is an extremely efficient diagnostic test. And I think the reason for that is that we get to directly visualize the mucosal surface of the GI tract. And for the purpose of this talk, the stomach, and we get to combine that uh, with histopathology. Uh, and so everything is direct and it results in really giving us uh, very important information for patient management. Uh, foreign bodies are commonly seen in the stomach uh, and endoscopy represents a minimally invasive way to remove the foreign bodies. Uh, overall, we have always felt this to be a relatively safe procedure in dogs and cats. And a recent study at uh, Ohio State University uh, looked at almost 2,000 cases that they had done. Uh, and the most serious complication is perforation of the GI tract. And you can clearly see that this occurred uh, in less than 2% of all cats uh, and less than uh, a tenth of 1% of all dogs. So it is really a safe procedure. Uh, it's moderately priced, and that's certainly going to vary from practice to practice. Uh, a very important point, and I've been teaching veterinarians to do endoscopy for many, many years, and compared to other procedures such as ultrasound, et cetera, this is a relatively easy procedure to learn and to master. And from my standpoint, every time I would get to grab the endoscope in practice, it was always fun. And you're always seeing things that perhaps you've never seen before. Uh, perhaps you're not sure what you're seeing. And so it's always very challenging. And the image on the lower right part of the screen, you can see we're in the uh, stomach of a dog and there are two worms. These are physoloptera worms that are attached to the mucosa. Uh, and these were findings we did not expect to see. 
So I want to start very briefly with a case to illustrate the utility of endoscopy and also to show you uh, how much fun it can be in everyday practice. Uh, so I saw a, a very older um, Weimaraner that came to see me for a month of vomiting, vomiting every day, one to three times a day. And in a 13 year old dog, that type of history certainly suggests some form of gastric cancer. Uh, as we worked up the patient, uh, radiographs were taken, and I think you can clearly see on the ventral dorsal view that in the stomach, there's some air, and then you can see surrounding um, an unusual soft tissue or foreign body density within the stomach. You can see that clearly on the lateral view also. But if you look carefully at the entire radiograph, you can see that the small intestine has been moved aside. There is a mass-like effect present here in the middle of the VD radiograph. And if you look carefully, you can see some linear air in the lumen of the small intestine and the filling um, with an intraluminal foreign body. And on the lateral view, it's not as clear, but you can see the area I'm talking about right over here. So despite the fact that the owner reported that this dog does not chew foreign material, that this dog has not had exposure to foreign material, uh, obviously it has a foreign body. And it has a foreign body in the stomach, which may or may not be attached to a foreign body that is further down in the small intestine. And how far into the small intestine, it's difficult to tell. Um, on both of these views, we really could not be sure. Uh, there's no doubt endoscopically we can grasp and remove what's present in the stomach. Uh, in the small intestine, that's a different story. Depending on how far down and how tightly it's packed, that may be difficult. We did recommend exploratory surgery on this dog where both the stomach and the small intestinal foreign body could be dealt with at the same time. Due to the dog's age, the owner did not wish to have surgery performed and suggested if we thought we could help the dog endoscopically to do it. Sometimes we're able to grasp the small intestinal foreign material and remove it. Other times we can't, uh, and we do have a very um, interesting endoscopic accessory, a pair of scissors that we can pass through the biopsy channel that if foreign material is going from the stomach into the duodenum that we cannot remove, we may be able to cut off what is present within the duodenum uh, and give that a chance to pass on its own and then remove what was in the stomach. So that was our plan. In the small intestine, it's really important to get the endoscope as far into the small intestine as possible and grasp the foreign material as distally from the stomach as you can, that will improve your chances of removing it. Unfortunately, in this case, we're looking here at the antrum of the stomach and it's totally packed by this unknown material. Uh, I was totally unable to pass the endoscope alongside of the foreign material into the antrum and then into the small intestine. This structure here, this rim that we're seeing is the angularis incisura. I'll go over that in a little while, but it is the main landmark of the stomach and separates the antral cavity from the body of the stomach. So I was unable to go ahead and get into the antrum and duodenum. I was able to grasp this material with a foreign body forcep and gently pull. And to my surprise, it continued to go ahead um, and, um, and to come out as I gently pulled it out. Uh, so uh, it continued to come out and we seem to get fairly lucky at this point. And I think to everybody's surprise in the room, we found three pair of underwear that had formed a long linear foreign body that was wrapped together. Uh, and part of it was in the stomach and part of it went down into both the descending and the ascending duodenum. So we're able to get all of this removed without having to do major surgery on the dog. The dog quickly recovered. And as you can see, the owner had good and expensive taste in underwear. Um, 
this embarrassed the owner a little bit, but she was delighted that we were able to help our dog and that we did not find evidence of gastric cancer. Okay, so before we move specifically to the stomach, there's a couple of generalities that I always like to review. Um, whenever we're moving through the GI tract, the three terms of safe endoscopy is centralized, insufflate, and advance with the lumen being visible. Centralized means you use your control knobs up here to maneuver the tip of the endoscope to the center of your lumen. Insufflate, you cover the bottom button with a finger, you insufflate air into the GI lumen, uh, that distends it, enabling you to see and advance your endoscope into the lumen as long as you can see the lumen carefully. If you advance the endoscope into the lumen, then you have a very, very, very small chance of causing serious damage to the GI tract and perforating it. Sometimes you can see six, eight, 10 centimeters down the GI tract and you can move a long distance. Other times you can only see for a centimeter or two and you advance the endoscope, then you centralize, insufflate, uh, and then advance further. So we move slowly down the GI tract. Now, diagnostically, whether we're doing an upper or lower GI endoscopy, we try to advance the endoscope as far as we safely can. And then we do our complete exam uh, and collection of diagnostic samples, especially biopsy samples, as we withdraw the endoscope and we come out. So as we're moving out, we will biopsy any lesions we see in the stomach, We'll also will take several biopsies from the pyloric area, the angularis, the body of the stomach along the greater curvature, and then the cardia in a retroflex position. If necessary, we may take a brush cytology specimen as the lower image on your screen shows you here. We are extending a cytology brush along the greater curvature, collecting cells to put on a slide, which will help us in evaluating the presence of helicobacter. As we are withdrawing the endoscope, we distend the lumen by insufflating air. We gently rotate the control knob so we can view the entire circumference of the mucosa, whether this is the colon, the duodenum, or the esophagus. In this way, we can make it very, very difficult to miss a significant lesion. So we, we view the entire surface of the mucosa as we withdraw the endoscope. And there are three rules of not forcing things when you're doing endoscopy. One, don't force the endoscope into the GI tract. That's a good way to go ahead and cause damage and perhaps perforation. Two, do not force any accessories, whether they be biopsy forceps, foreign body retrieval forceps, balloon dilators into the working biopsy channel. If they don't go, there's a reason for that. And by forcing it, you can damage your endoscope. And number three, uh, if your control knobs do not deflect the tip of the endoscope any further, don't continue to turn them because that's a good way to damage the, the wires that allow control of the tip of the endoscope. Now, there are a few places where you have to push the endoscope a little bit harder than you do in other areas. And that would be at the GI sphincters, at the colonic flexures, uh, and a, especially in cats, when you're trying to enter the antrum and to visualize the pylorus, you have to push a little harder than other places, but a little harder is not forcing. So when are we gonna perform gastroscopy in dogs and cats? The most common indications are animals that have chronic vomiting, animals that have either a suspect or a proven gastric foreign body, or animals that have signs of small intestinal disease and we need to enter the duodenum. And in order to do that, we obviously have to go through the stomach. 
Some less common indications would be unexplained anorexia or weight loss, uh, would be moderate or severe uh, hematomesis, where we're losing a lot of blood and we need to find out the cause to treat it specifically. And if you're using a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tube, putting it in through the endoscope is a minimally invasive way to do it. And so here's an image of a duodenum in an animal where the duodenum is very thickened and granular. Uh, and this animal most likely had signs of chronic small bowel disease uh, and biopsy and examination of the duodenum was important in case management. So some of the common lesions that we're going to see, uh, mucosal changes such as redness or hyperemia or hemorrhage. And you can see some hemorrhage uh, on the lower image, uh, lower right image of the screen. If you wash off some of that blood, you would see there are little erosions underneath it. We may see evidence of an erosion or ulcer and the lower left image shows a close up of a very, very large and deep ulcer surrounded by a mass. This was an adenocarcinoma that had ulcerated. We may see masses that are not ulcerated. We may see foreign material as in the upper left screen. This is a leather belt that the dog has chewed up into many, many uniform strips. We may see retained food despite a prolonged fast. Uh, and we may see evidence of too many lymphoid follicles in the stomach. These small areas that we're seeing are lymphoid follicles. And this is up in the cardiac region of the stomach. Uh, and normally you see either none or very few. This type of hyperplasia is often associated with chronic gastritis and very often with a helicobacter infection. So those are the lesions that we see between endoscopy and our biopsies. What are the common diagnoses that we often make? Those would be chronic gastritis, a foreign body, an ulcer, neoplasia. Uh, occasionally we see benign neoplasia, but often we see malignant neoplasia. Pyloric hypertrophy, which is an example we're seeing on the upper image on your screen. This thickened mucosal fold at the pylorus is due to benign hypertrophy. We may see a delayed gastric emptying disorder, uh, or we may see the stomach worm Physoloptera. The lower image is an ulcer uh, in a cat that had inflammatory bowel disease and chronic gastritis. So those are the um, the indications for doing gastroscopy and some of the things that we see. Uh, the preparation is pretty straightforward. We need to have the stomach empty and that usually means at least a 12 hour fast. Animals can have water, but no food. And historically, if the animal is vomiting uh, six, eight, 10, 12 hours after eating, demonstrating delayed vomiting of food, uh, then we would like to perform a longer fasting period to allow that food to move out. Endoscopy of the stomach uh, is done under general anesthesia. I would recommend that we avoid opioid premedications as many of the commonly used opioids increase pyloric tone and may make it more difficult for you to pass the endoscope through the pylorus into the duodenum. The animals are in left lateral recumbency, and that means that the antrum and the pylorus is on the dog's right side, and it means it's away from the table, and the internal organs are not pressing down on this area, but it's an area we can distend with air, move the endoscope up into, uh, and enter relatively easily. And we use a mouth gag, uh, in the animals not to prevent them from biting the endoscope. That's the job of the general anesthesia. We use it to make sure that the teeth are opened up slightly and you're not rubbing your endoscope back and forth across the molar teeth, damaging your insertion tube. So we go through the esophagus into the stomach. We're gonna be visualized first and see rugal folds. 
We want to assess these folds before we insufflate a little bit of air to distend them. The scope will move along the greater curvature by gravity as the dog is laying in left lateral recumbency. We will slide down and along the greater curvature and we will locate the angularis incisura. The angularis incisura is the main landmark in the stomach. It tells us where we are. It tells us in which direction we have to go to enter the antrum and pylorus. It tells us which direction we have to retroflex in to see the gastric body and the gastroesophageal junction. We advance to the pylorus first. We will enter the duodenum. We'll enter down the duodenum as far as the endoscope safely and easily moves. We'll examine the duodenum and take our biopsy samples as we go ahead uh, and uh, withdraw the endoscope. Then we enter the stomach, we examine the stomach, we take biopsies of lesions and the locations we've talked about, and then we will go ahead and retroflex the scope, tip it up at the angularis, uh, distend that area and have our first view of the lesser curvature, which is this area down here, the gastroesophageal junction, and this first part of the greater curvature. This is the area we have not yet seen, and it's important to look at this area, examine it, and biopsy before we finish our procedure. Now, normally the stomach is kind of pink and tan, mucosal in color. It is smooth and it's glistening. Before we distend those rugal folds, they should be equally tall and wide, uh, and the rugal folds will move us down towards the antrum and the antrum lacks rugal folds and down the antrum at the end will be the pylorus. As we retroflex and we look at the cardiac region and we distend this area, it's possible to see submucosal blood vessels uh, in this area. The pylorus itself is very variable in appearance. It changes from animal to animal and it will change during an exam within an individual animal. So when you first get in there, the pylorus may appear uh, in one manner and it may change its appearance. In general, the lumen should be empty. There might be a little adherent mucus or white froth possible. And occasionally under general anesthesia, the stomach will start to contract three to five times per minute and on the image on your screen, this is a wave of contraction moving down the body into the antrum. And this disrupts your endoscopic exam, making it difficult for you to move the endoscope. You have to wait for the contraction to pass, then you move back and put the scope where you need to and perform whatever other action you were trying to do. So we come through the esophagus, dog is in left lateral recumbency, the endoscope will illuminate this area of the body right here. The endoscope will then move in, get close to the mucosa, and as you gently advance it, it will come around the greater curve, it will come around this angle, and it will tip up in this region, and it will point right here at the reflection of the lesser curvature, which is your landmark, the angularis incisura. So gravity will help us to uh, illuminate the angularis and to see where we are. So two views in an empty stomach, you can see the rugal folds moving down in this direction with a little more air, they're distended. And essentially, if we advance the endoscope parallel to the rugal folds, it will move us down towards the antrum, which you can clearly see down here lacks rugal folds. The beginning of this fold here, or a little more of it here, is that angularis incisura, that as we slip around the greater curvature, once we identify, um, you'll be able to figure out where you are in the stomach. So we mentioned that the stomach should be empty of food with an adequate fast. Here's two examples of animals that despite a 14 to 16 hour fast, there was plenty of food still in the stomach indicating some delayed gastric emptying. When the food particles are small and there's fluid present, you may be able to insufflate some water 
uh, apply suction and clean this area up to visualize the mucosa and make an appropriate diagnosis. If you have a lot of particulate food like this, it's going to be very, very difficult. And if this happens, sometimes the best thing to do is to wake the animal up and then try again with a longer fast. Looking at mucosa uh, hemorrhages associated with gastritis, uh, some fresh hemorrhages that we're seeing here on the left and some hemorrhages that have been there a little longer, the acid in the stomach uh, producing the dark melanic type color that we see. If we wash these hemorrhages away, we may be able to see very, very tiny erosions present. So here is a, um, a young to middle-aged cat presenting with anorexia and weight loss. And endoscopically, the greater curvature area in the body was full of this foreign material. I'll give you a minute to go ahead and try to guess what this is. But the answer is these were hair ties. Uh, and the owner felt that the cats really enjoyed playing with these hair ties. But the owner reported to me that the cats tended to lose their toys and she had to continue to throw more out. So this is 11 hair ties that were present in the cat's stomach and they were all removed endoscopically. These are two cats, a young cat on the left, an older cat on the right that has a lymphoma of the body of the stomach. On the left, these rugal folds are thickened. They are irregular and they do not distend when you insufflate air. This is the best that we can do. On the right, there's a big ulcerated area present amidst some persistent rugal folds that are not distending. In biopsying the image on the right, we tend to stay away from the ulcerated area because it's usually thinner. It may also have uh, exposed blood vessels underneath this debris. We biopsy multiple times on the edge of the lesion. And one of the things that's important is that when you are biopsying a mass, don't just biopsy one time. Take a biopsy, say right here, and then go back and put the forceps in the same location two or three or four times, get a deeper sample because the superficial samples um, may go ahead and indicate just inflammation and the neoplastic process may only be found if you go deeper to the lesion. So we come down here and we identify part of the lesser curvature and the angularis incisura. This is what I call the gastric lighthouse. It tells you where you are and where you have to manipulate the endoscope. So on the left, we insufflated some air uh, and you can see we have kind of a shelf-like angularis here. Uh, the image on your right, we have not put as much air in and the shelf is a little thickened. But by seeing this, we know that if we Retroflex and tip the endoscope in this direction, we'll be seeing the body of the stomach and then the cardiac region. If we go below the shelf, and tip the endoscope in the down position, we'll go ahead uh, and we'll get towards the antrum and the pylorus further down. So these are two examples of a normal appearing angularis. This is an older dog with chronic vomiting and weight loss, and you can clearly see the angularis is not normal. It is very, very thickened. It's irregular. There is spontaneous hemorrhage. If we look down underneath the angularis into the antrum, uh, there are multiple small masses here. A close-up of the mass, you get an idea that you can see this unusual glandular pattern, this branching of these white areas. And once again, multiple biopsies at the same location going deeper into the mass revealed this was a gastric adenocarcinoma. We see ulcers in this area. We see a very large dark ulcer on your left. 
uh, with some thickening surrounding it. This was a benign ulcer in an older Labrador that was receiving NSAIDs for chronic arthritis. Here's a similar dark ulcer with a little irregularity, but more of a mass surrounding it. This was a malignant ulcer, an ulcerated adenocarcinoma. Once we've identified the angularis, we want to go down and go through the pylorus because an important principle is that the more manipulation you do in the stomach, the more air that you insufflate, the tighter the pylorus can become and the more difficult it is to get through. So if you're going to enter the duodenum, which you are in many diagnostic cases, uh, you need to get down there as soon as possible, go through the pylorus before it gets too tight, get into the duodenum, collect your samples, and then come back and evaluate the rest of the stomach. So this is what this area looks like. On the lower left of the screen, this is a dog, and you're seeing the entire antral cavity here. The angularis is off on this side, and way in the distance is the pylorus right there. On the cat, this is a very typical view that we see. We see the angularis, the beginning of the lesser curvature, but the rest of the antral cavity and the pylorus is tucked behind the angularis. And in the cat was one of those areas that I mentioned, you may have to push the endoscope a little harder than you would in a dog. So we place the endoscope in this direction, we place it against the mucosa, we deflect the tip of the endoscope in this manner, and we go behind the angularis and insufflate, and then we'll get a better view of what the pylorus looks like in the cat. Now, I generally break the appearance of the pylorus down uh, into two forms. The quote, user-friendly pylorus, where you can see the pylorus is relatively open, relatively in the center of your screen, uh, and relatively inviting. Uh, and these make entering the duodenum quite easy. The second type that we see way too often is what I call the hostile pylorus. And here the pylorus has lots of tone. The muscular, muscular sphincter is contracted and it becomes much more difficult to pass the endoscope through. Things like distending the stomach, manipulating the endoscope in the stomach, uh, looking at lots of areas before getting to the pylorus can help to increase this tone. Uh, and we'll show you a few things that can help you to get through the duodenum. So looking at the antrum, what are some of the lesions that we see? The pylorus in, on the left is way over here. There are punctate mucosal hemorrhages scattered throughout the antrum. And what was interesting in this dog is the rest of the stomach was grossly normal. Here's another instance, the pylorus is here in the middle. It's showing a fair amount of tone and there are erosions that are filled with blood scattered throughout the antral cavity. Biopsy of both of these animals indicated chronic gastritis. We see cancers in this area. Uh, the dog on your left, this red area is indicating mucosa that is completely eroded and we biopsy anywhere along this region and it comes back lymphoma. In the cat, you're seeing the angularis on this side here and the entrance into the antrum is filled with two white raised masses, uh, making it very difficult to get around the corner into the antral cavity. In the cat, you can also see coming off the body of the stomach where the body joins the antrum, you can see evidence of another mass. Uh, once again, lymphoma in the cat. Uh, two ulcers. In the middle is the pylorus in this dachshund. These are also NSAID ulcers. They are extremely deep. Uh, and it did worry me that these may, may have perforated already or were thin enough to perforate. Luckily, 
During our exam, no damage was created and the dog went on after removing it from the NSAIDs and treating the ulcers to make a complete recovery. We mentioned pyloric hypertrophy. There's another example here showing a 360 degree mucosal fold. This is from a 15 year old Chihuahua and the white that you're seeing surrounding this is some residual barium sulfate that the referring veterinarian gave 48 hours prior to our, excuse me, to our endoscopy. And this dog had surgery and this is a resected specimen showing a thickened mucosa and a thickened muscular layer in a dog with benign pyloric hypertrophy. Benign tumors do occur uh, in dogs in the stomach. Uh, the pylorus on your right is up here and there are multiple small nodules that are for the most part not interfering with gastric emptying and these were adenomas. Here's another case with a large pedunculated uh, mushroom shaped adenoma that is right in front of the pylorus and was going ahead and interfering with gastric emptying. Uh, if you look at one of the previous endoscopy talks that was given by Dr. Mike Willard, he demonstrates very nicely a method of, of putting a snare over this and cauterizing this lesion and removing this lesion through the endoscope. So you can check out that tape if that's something you want to pursue further. And then finally, four views of an animal right here, uh, looking at the pyloric canal surrounded by a multi um, nodular lesion that on biopsy was an adenocarcinoma. So we see the pylorus, we go through the pylorus, which I'll spend a few minutes on. Uh, we'll go in the duodenum and then we'll come back and finish our exam of the stomach. And Dr. Tweed, this might be a good time to stop and see if you, um, if the audience has posed any questions for me. Yeah, Mike, uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, uh, two of them related to pre-med. And what pre-med do you recommend if you're not using opioids? And then the second part of the question is, do you use Serenia before scoping your patients? Okay, good, good question. And, and I'll answer the second one first. Um, uh, my experience has been not to use Serenia uh, routinely, although there are other people that use it routinely and recommend it. So by not using it, there's nothing that I've seen postoperatively um, that has produced a problem. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody that's actually looked at this and done a study, but I know there are plenty of people who are very, very experienced with endoscopy that do routinely use it. Uh, I have not. Uh, the second thing, and, and of course, being at a university, when you look at pre-meds and anesthesia, as an internist, we're, we're a little handcuffed uh, because the anesthesia is managed by anesthesiologists and the anesthesia section, and they know my wishes, but they don't always conform to them. <laughs> so um, we don't have the benefit of, of essentially being able to, to pick. But if we don't use opioids, um, you know, I've, I've had very excellent experiences with things like ACE promazine, uh, sometimes uh, glycopyrrolate, um, you can go ahead and, and induce with propofol. Um, some people have actually used uh, metadetomidine. Um, so there, there are things that can be used, but we, we do have uh, at least one very good study in dogs that clearly showed the use of, of several different forms of opioids do make it more difficult. So um, sometimes our anesthesiologists like to make it more difficult and they like to see me have trouble trying to enter the duodenum. Uh, and it does make a difference. That said, uh, it doesn't mean you cannot get into the duodenum with an opioid, but it, it certainly makes a difference. And if you are starting out and learning to do endoscopy, 
you want to make sure that entering the duodenum in most of your cases is something you can be successful in. And, and so you can do a complete exam, get a full set of samples, uh, and completely evaluate your patients. Okay. Um, and you may be answering this, but one question was, are there any drugs that you can give to help you get through the pylorus? Okay, so good, good question. Uh, the answer is yes, uh, but the bigger answer is it, it's rare that you have to use them. So uh, we did some work uh, quite a number of years ago in cats, um, and we demonstrated that um, some intravenous uh, metoclopramid might be helpful in, in passing the, the pylorus in cats. We found that several other drugs actually hindered that. Um, similar studies that were done in dogs demonstrated once again that a little bit of metoclopramid might be helpful. But I think I'm gonna show you some other techniques that may make having to use additional drugs um, uh, pretty uncommon. And I think you can be successful without them. Okay, that's good for now, thanks. Okay, very good. Okay, we'll continue on. Um, I'm gonna just spend a few minutes on the duodenum, realizing this is a talk about gastroscopy, but you know, one of the major reasons to do gastroscopy is to enter the duodenum. So I didn't wanna leave everybody hanging. So uh, a couple of tips for entering the duodenum. Uh, as I've mentioned, minimal gastric insufflation and manipulation. So get to the pylorus quickly. Don't distend the stomach if you don't have to. Don't look at the lesions that are there. Don't mess with a foreign body or anything else you have to. Get down to the duodenum first and try to keep a user-friendly pylorus from becoming a hostile pylorus. So get there quickly. And once again, avoid the opioids. We use these more commonly in dogs uh, and it does make a difference. Now, when I teach endoscopy to veterinarians, um, they very often have this idea that the pylorus is going to be open and you just centralize, insufflate and advance the endoscope right through the pylorus and in, into the duodenum. And I call this a, a drive-through endoscopy. And I can tell you from my experience, this is not very common. By the time you get there, driving through on one try is often a failure. And what you have to do is to step back and realize that the pylorus isn't wide open. It's very difficult to align the scope and that you really have to touch the mucosa, usually around the edges of the pyloric orifice, and then drive the endoscope through in that direction. So drive-throughs do occur, but most of the time they don't. So you align the endoscope to the center of the pylorus by using your control knobs. Usually you will come, you push the endoscope against the mucosa uh, right on the edge of that pylorus and you'll get what's called a red out. And basically you'll see a big red screen and that's because the lens of your endoscope is right against the mucosa and you can't see anything. You insufflate that area, uh, you advance with gentle pressure. What you're looking for is a little bit of a black hole. You're looking for that pyloric uh, orifice. And if you're off to the side, all you need to do as you insufflate is you very gently uh, displace your control knobs a little bit, maybe a sixteenth of a rotation. Rotate them right, left, up and down. You're trying to take the tip of the endoscope from the edge of the pylorus and angle it into that black hole. If you see the black hole, advance gently with insufflation, you'll see the endoscope slide through into the duodenum. If you push and you don't see the black hole and it's not entering the duodenum, you withdraw your endoscope and you repeat the alignment and do the same thing again. And usually after two or three times, you should be able to enter the duodenum. Realize that every time you poke the endoscope into the pylorus, 
it gets a little tighter. So you want to try to be successful as early as possible. If for some reason you're unable to get good alignment or you see an image like you're seeing on the lower right portion of the screen where the angularis is stretched thin, the antrum looks like a slit. And as you pass your endoscope, it automatically retroflexes and you're looking at the gastroesophageal junction. When that happens, it means the body of the stomach has distended with air too much. And you need to remove the air, withdraw the endoscope and slide it down into the antrum without insufflating much air. Then you can get a decent alignment and hopefully be able to get this mucosal contact and then slip the endoscope forward. If none of this works and you cannot get good alignment on the pyloric orifice, it's tipped off to the side, there's a fold in front of it, you can rotate the dog into dorsal recumbency. That will change the orientation uh, and give you a chance to get a better orientation into the orifice. If you have the advantage of perhaps having a smaller endoscope, a pediatric size that's a couple of millimeters less in diameter, it may be time to switch out endoscopes and get a smaller scope to pass through. Only if these maneuvers fail would I recommend either pharmacologic uh, manipulation with metoclopramid or what some people will do is to pass the biopsy forcep uh, in a closed position into the edge of the pyloric orifice and attempt to slip the endoscope over this by using that forcep as a stent. Uh, to me, that is something that should be done only as a last ditch effort because you really have a bayonet on the tip of the endoscope. And if you push that in, there's a possibility you can perforate the stomach. So entering the duodenum, is what I call the final frontier. It's the hardest thing to learn when you're doing upper GI endoscopy, but the hardest thing to learn doesn't mean it's that hard. And with a little bit of experience uh, and good instruction, hopefully you'll be successful and you'll enter the duodenum and you'll be rewarded with this type of view right here. And essentially, we come down the body of the stomach, the angularis is right here. We are now going up in the antral cavity. The pylorus is here, you slip through, you slide along the orad edge of the duodenum and then you enter the descending duodenum here and you'll be able now with a little air insufflation see a luminal view. And we advance the endoscope as far into the duodenum as it safely moves. And here you can see we have a beautiful head-on view. There's a little bit of mucus here. The mucosa is a little bit uh, roughened compared to the stomach. And this is due to the, the, uh, the, the villi that are present. You can see the lumen is going off to the left. And we're probably down here at the distal duodenal flexure, uh, and that's going to turn in an ORAD direction and course back towards the duodenum. Uh, in many cases, we're able to get the endoscope past this flexure into the ascending duodenum. In cats, sometimes we're actually able to get uh, across the cranial duodenal flexure here and into the jejunum. Uh, in dogs, uh, sometimes we can get into that ascending duodenum. The key point is as long as the endoscope moves easily and there are no serious uh, impediments to moving the endoscope, you advance it as far as it easily goes. Then you withdraw and take your biopsy samples. Once we're finished in the duodenum, we're going to go ahead um, and examine and biopsy in the stomach. Uh, we're going to look at the cardia, the angularis, the body of the stomach, and then when we're done, we're going to visualize the area that we have not yet seen, and that's the retroflex view looking at the gastroesophageal junction. So here's the gastroesophageal junction. The black thing is the endoscope coming from the esophagus into the stomach and turned on itself, and we do that by rotating the 
inner control knob uh, all the way in a counterclockwise direction, and that will retroflex the endoscope in at least 180 degrees. And that allows us to look back on ourselves and to evaluate the gastroesophageal junction, the cardia, uh, and part of the lesser curvature. Um, to get closer to the gastroesophageal junction, you withdraw the endoscope. To get further away, you push the endoscope in, and I'll show you an image of that in a minute. You can clearly see that there's an area behind the endoscope that we cannot see because the endoscope is between our view right here uh, and the mucosal surface. So in order to see behind it, we just want to very gently rotate the endoscope. We call this applying torque. And by simultaneously rotating the control handle and the insertion tube, no more than an eighth of a turn, maybe a sixteenth of a turn in a clockwise and counterclock and counterclockwise direction, we will twist the endoscope and the area behind the endoscope will now come into view, either here or here. And that way we can see uh, if there are any lesions. And one thing I will tell you is that small foreign bodies present in the stomach in left lateral recumbency will always lodge right in this area. And so you may be chasing a foreign body that you saw on a radiograph. You go in there and you don't see it and it's not in the duodenum and it's not in the stomach. Don't forget to look behind the endoscope because it may be tucked in right there um, because of the animal's position. So we retroflex, we're looking at the gastroesophageal junction, the cardia, uh, the, the part of the greater curvature here, and part of the lesser curvature here. This is the area that we did not see at all when we passed the endoscope in and went into the duodenum. Now, on the left screen is a retroflex view. You can clearly see the gastroesophageal junction. That junction is slightly open. The gray that you're seeing there is looking into the esophagus. And so some of the air that we're distending the stomach with to flatten out these folds uh, is actually going up into the esophagus. Not as distinct uh, as in many cases, but you can see here uh, as we distend this area, submucosal and mucosal blood vessels are clearly visible. Uh, the image on the right is what I call a deep retroflex. Here I push the endoscope in, getting further away from the gastroesophageal junction. And this allows me to see the angularis incisura, the antrum below it, and this area that runs from the edge of the angularis to the endoscope, and then from the endoscope to the other edge of the angularis, this triangle is the lesser curvature. This is the hardest area to see because most of the time we are viewing in front of the endoscope. And each exam, you wanna make sure you get a good deep retroflex so you make sure that there are no lesions here. You apply some torque to the endoscope and apply a little bit of a twist so you see behind the endoscope to make sure that there are no foreign bodies there. In this dog, these are some pine needles and there were some chewed up acorns that were present that had packed the antrum. Okay, here's a radiograph showing a round leaded object and on endoscopic view it was a marble and the reason it showed up uh, with this increased density uh, on the radiograph is because marbles used to be made out of leaded glass. So you're seeing the lead there. Uh, off to the side, uh, this is the endoscope here. So just one little trick um, in removing foreign bodies from this area, it is difficult to work in a retroflex position, upside down and backwards with the endoscope rotated 180 degrees. So what we like to do is to place the animals in sternal recumbency 
by gravity, the foreign body will pop out of the cardiac region and will fall into the body of the stomach. And you'll be able to operate with your endoscope in a head-on view without the endoscope retroflex. And it will be very easy to move your foreign body forceps in and out of the endoscope. So an important trick to remember to change the position when you have a foreign body like this, it will be easier to grasp and to remove. Here's a retroflex view. The endoscope is up here. The gastroesophageal junction is here. Uh, and here's an animal that was receiving aspirin and has these linear, er excuse me, sorry, has these linear erosions coming down. So relatively superficial, but relatively diffuse. Retroflex view, endoscope here. There is a smooth mass present and you can judge its size in relation to the endoscope, which was about 10 millimeters in diameter. So this mass is about 10 millimeters by about 15 to 20 millimeters in length. Uh, I've taken a biopsy there, removing the mucosa and going a little bit deeper. This is the classic location uh, and the classic appearance of a smooth muscle tumor, a lyomyoma at the gastroesophageal junction. The dog was showing no clinical signs for this. Uh, we endoscoped this dog because it had an esophageal stricture. We elected not to do surgery and at a later date, uh, you can see in the same location that this mass has grown in size uh, and over a period of about two years, sorry, uh, it has grown in size. So lyomyosarcoma, oh, excuse me, lyomyoma of the gastroesophageal junction. Uh, we can see ulcers in this region. Uh, on the left, you can see the gastroesophageal junction, the endoscope, and next to the endoscope, a fairly large ulcer, especially in a cat. Uh, and a close-up of that ulcer uh, shows that it is deep. And once again, biopsies you should take not on the inside of the ulcer, but along the edges of the ulcer. And if this was a mass, I would go back and I would biopsy it two, three, four times in one location to get deeper samples. And I would do that in two or three places along a mass. So as you're doing your gastroscopy, remember you are attempting to move the endoscope forward and you're insufflating and you may not be paying as much attention to how much air you're putting in. It is possible to over distend the stomach, make it difficult for the animal to breathe. So the person who is monitoring your anesthesia may tell you the pulse oximeter is going down. Please take some air out of the stomach. As you are finished your exam, suction any residual air and any fluid out of the stomach this will reduce the chances of the animal of vomiting and aspirating this fluid. As you go through the esophagus on the way out, suction any fluid that has reflux from the stomach in this area, inspect and then suction the area around the pharynx and the larynx because some fluid can come up along the endoscope and could be aspirated when the endotracheal tube is removed. And in large dogs um, that are, in left lateral recumbency, remember they may have a very large cheek pouch that is full of saliva. And when you set the dog sternal, that is also another area where the animal can aspirate. So just suction that out or wipe it out with a paper towel and do everything possible to make sure the animal's recovery from anesthesia is smooth. And one of the important things that I've tried to emphasize is that if you're doing a diagnostic endoscopy, you're looking at an animal for chronic vomiting, chronic small bowel diarrhea, anorexia, weight loss, you take a full series of biopsies. You give the pathologist all the samples from the duodenum and the stomach and the lesions that you see, regardless of whether you see gross lesions or not. 
an animal that has a grossly normal stomach and duodenum still can have chronic gastritis, can have inflammatory bowel disease, and even can have diffuse small cell lymphoma. So don't be fooled. Even if the mucosa looks normal, take the time that it takes to go ahead and get a full series of biopsies. So in the stomach and an upper GI endoscopy, we're gonna biopsy any lesions. We're gonna get at least six to eight samples from the duodenum. And we're gonna biopsy a minimum of two samples from the area around the pylorus, the angularis, the cardia in the retroflex position, and then the body right along the greater curvature. And we're gonna make sure the pathologist has a good overview of what the tissue looks like. So to emphasize, always biopsy, even if there are no gross lesions. And remember, we get the endoscope as deep into the animal, whether it's the duodenum or the colon, as we can safely do that. And then we will examine and biopsy on the way out. And just one tip for biopsying the cardia. In visualizing the cardia, we distend this area and flatten the mucosa. And that allows us for good visualization. But once you have picked out an area that you wish to biopsy, suction out some of the air, allow the mucosa to soften up and um, for it not to be so taut. And then you'll be able to go ahead and apply your biopsy forcep and get a decent sized sample. So with that, I think I have covered what I'd like to cover. And uh, Dr. Tweed, I think we hopefully have some time left to answer some questions. Yeah, Mike, we've got a couple of questions. Um, and it had to, some of these relate to biopsy. And one of the questions is, uh, what kind of a biopsy forceps do you prefer? And then, um, is it ever possible to perforate the stomach with your biopsy forceps? Okay, so two excellent questions. Uh, the first one is biopsy forceps. Um, there's a lot of personal preference involved in what you select. So what I like to use may be different than what Dr. Tweed likes to use and different than Dr. Willard or, or many, many other people. So we do have a little bit of information on biopsy forceps and their ability uh, to, to, to get high quality biopsies. Uh, so th these studies can guide us somewhat. Um, what I have preferred to use um, is a fenestrated ellipsical biopsy with a needle. And most recently I have moved from reusable forceps to disposable forceps, um, which I have found uh, are extremely sharp and can be associated with large and high quality biopsies. Uh, I like the forceps with the needle because they allow me to use the needle to skewer the tissue. And especially in the colon and the duodenum, when it's easy for the forceps to slide off the mucosa, it helps to stabilize them. Uh, they're ellipsoid, and that means they're a little bit larger than oval forceps, once again, allowing you to get a larger piece of tissue, uh, very sharp forceps, so you can get a good chunk of the tissue. And the fenestrations um, on each side of the cup allows the tissue to actually uh, move uh, through the forcep and to gather more tissue uh, within the forcep. So that's my personal preference. Uh, and I think I get over the years, um, fairly high quality biopsies. The second question, is it possible to, um, to perforate the stomach? The answer is yes. Uh, it's hard to do if you follow good principles. Um, so things like, you know, make sure you have good visualization over what you're doing, that you push uh, the, the forceps gently against the mucosa and understand that if you have ulcerated tissue, whether it's a benign ulcer or a malignant ulcer, that's an area you wanna stay away from 
Um, so that will reduce your chances of perforation. So the answer is it can occur. It should be very, very hard to do uh, in most animals, unless you're really there biopsying an ulcerated area. And by staying to the edge of that, that shouldn't be a problem. Great. Uh, we have one last question. And what is the source of the scissors that you mentioned earlier for cutting uh, uh, some of those cloth foreign bodies? Okay. Uh, the answer to that question is I don't know. <laughs> uh, my source was my endoscopy technician who um, uh, always looks for these things and sent me an email years ago and said, I saw this online. Would you like us to go ahead and uh, get one? And uh, we did. And we've only used it a few times, but it has been pretty helpful. So uh, I, I would just un unfortunately just um, search that on online. And if you have trouble finding it, uh, send me an email. I'll email my technician and I'll get you a web address to do that. Yeah, one comment was bless the awesome tech. Bless the awesome tech. Oh, I, I'm going to say that uh, more than a comment. Uh, the, the, your, your endoscopy technician makes or breaks your procedure, saves you so much time takes good care of your equipment, keeps it clean, prevents transmission of infection. Uh, and I've been lucky over the years to work uh, with many really wonderful technicians, but the one I worked with for about the last 15 years made me look good. Uh, <laughs> she knew what I wanted before I knew what I wanted it. <laughs> well, that's great, Mike. Hey, thanks a lot, Mike, for the great presentation. It um, uh, enlightened us with a lot of different things. So I really appreciate that. And um, I, again, would like to thank the audience for joining us tonight. Um, next week, we're going to hear from Dr. Wayne McElwraith. He's an equine orthopedic surgeon. And he's going to talk about equine arthroscopy, how uh, we got started and what we can do. And so that uh, talk will be next Wednesday, October 21st at 8 p.m. And remember that this webinar, as well as all previous webinars, are available online at endoscopytalks.com. They're completely free. Uh, we'd encourage anybody to look at those. And I guess finally, just wishing everyone well. Um, good health in these challenging times, and we look forward to seeing you back hopefully next week. Thanks a lot.